I'm going to go ahead and introduce our host, who can then introduce our featured guest today, so we can get started. Um, welcome to our 50 Shades of Brown Treating Skin of Color webinar. This has been on Vivian's heart to do for quite some time because it's such a massive part of our market and a big topic for all of us that I don't know a whole lot about. I'll be very honest with that, but I learned a lot on the IG Live yesterday, so I feel much better today, and I'll learn even more today. But we have with us um, Vivian Ichindu today, who is our vendor relations manager. So she manages all things with all of our vendors for the conference, Aesthetic Next, and also just all of our marketplace vendors. So she scours the country looking for great additions to our marketplace for our AR users. And she found Eunice, who's been a fantastic addition for what we're able to offer you guys from an education standpoint, but also products as well. So I'm going to let Vivian take it over and introduce Eunice and get us kicked off today. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as Tiffany mentioned, this is a very exciting topic and I know it's one that a lot of our viewers and AR users have been interested in um, sinking their teeth into. So I'm super excited to introduce Eunice Kofi. She is a founder and chief cosmetic chemist. Um, she has a wealth of information and wealth of knowledge when it comes to treating skin of color, which we'll talk about what even is skin of color because it compromises a, a wide range of ethnicities. Um, and also fit scale. She has her own skincare line, Nueki, um, and she has launched her second annual um, Skin of Color conference. So tremendous, um, tremendous wealth of knowledge when it comes to the industry, treating skin, skin of color, but also um, when it comes to just being able to be a boss and um, owning her own uh, beauty brand. So really excited to learn more about that. Thank you so much, Eunice. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be able to share my knowledge with you all. And so um, please feel free to um, put in the chat any questions that you may have, and I'll try my best to answer them for you. Um, this uh, It's a whole lot to learn about skin of color, and I tried my best to condense as much as I could um, uh, to give you all the best. So today's presentation is 50 Shades of Brown Treating Skin of Color. And I can't talk to you about skin of color without first telling you my story because it, it definitely translates into why I do what I do today. So as a young girl, I was constantly picked on because of my dark skin. I was called all kinds of names, African booty scratcher, blackie, and it really took a toll on my self-esteem. It even became physical where, where girls would pull on my hair and try to beat me up. I, my saving grace was my father introducing me to science. And that's where I grew my love and my confidence in myself because I realized that I may not be viewed by my classmates as the smartest, as the most beautiful person in the room, but I will be viewed as the smartest person in the room. So I went on into uh, win many science fairs and I went on to college and majored in, um, in, uh, in, chemistry, molecular biology. And this is me as a kid um, uh, working with my dad um, in the lab and learning how to run science experiments. And so I went on to Florida A&M University and got a degree in chemistry, molecular biology. And it was there through a chance meeting with a organic lab professor where I learned about cosmetic science. So instead of us just doing the regular laboratories that were offered to us by the department, he said, you know what, I want to teach you guys something very practical. So he taught us how to make hair relaxers and lotions. And I got really, really into it. And that's um, when I realized, huh, I can take something that's very from the theory and make it very practical. My classmates would laugh at me in the lab and say, man, you know, you're so quiet. And I would say, yeah, because I'm really into what I'm doing. And so I started doing research with my professor. The department allowed me to take the research and use it towards my degree. And it was at that time that I discovered that there weren't a lot of clinical grade and medical grade or pharmaceutical grade products that were designed for skin of color. And uh, me being a woman of color, I grew up with dealing with 
uh, acne issues. And I remember as a kid, my dad being a pharmacist, having to go and buy different soaps for acne for me to try to clear my skin. And it wasn't until I got into college and as a chemistry student, I really understood the skin that I'm in and embraced my beauty more. Um, I went on to get a master's in pharmaceutical sciences from the University of Cincinnati, uh, where I focused in on cosmetic science. And throughout this whole process, um, I realized that this is something that I want to do later on down the road. Um, I wanted to start my own company, Nueki, where I will be able to focus more on skin of color and developing more products that are clinical grade that actually took into consideration the unique structure and function of skin of color. Now, what makes our, our brand very unique is that we incorporate traditional African medicine with modern science to be able to address common skin disorders such as acne, hyperpigmentation, um, and any other um, skin disorders. For a long time, people have not really delved into traditional African medicine. And I thought that was a, a way for me to segment into this field and be able to provide the consumer with the best so when I say skin of color, skin of color um, means so many things or is comprised of so many demographics. So when we talk about skin of color, it means persons of African descent, Middle Easterners, Latinos, Asians, Native Americans, Indians, Pacific Islanders, all of those uh, groups are considered people with skin of color because they have some um, pigment to their skin. Now, you may look at some of these pictures and you, and you would say, well, it's leaning more towards on the Caucasian end, but uh, the majority of these groups, their melanocytes are large enough or much larger than Caucasian skin to release a lot of melanin into the skin. So when uh, you look in the dermatology books or you talk to a dermatologist, um, they talk about these skin types broken down into phototypes. And it was created by a dermatologist, um, Dr. Fitzpatrick years ago, several years ago, where he broke them down into about six types. And so you have your type one, two, three, but the skin of color range typically ranges in the, between the type four and um, uh, the type uh, six. But you can still find some that are in type three, type two, and maybe even at times type one, but they still show the signs of um, what you would see um, in the type four, type five, and type six. Uh, uh, six skin phototypes. What would that look like with a type one that still fits within a uh, person of color? So it will look like maybe a person that might be biracial, um, who's very, very light skin. Um, you may have some um, persons that are from, let's say the Middle East that may fall within the type one range. Um, you may even find some black people who may have dark skinned parents, but somewhere down the line, they may have a Caucasian ancestor and it shows up in a type one or type two. So unfortunately, the big box brands tend to think one size fits all when it comes to developing solutions for skin of color. Um, for so many years, um, women and men of color have gone without um, being catered to when it comes to products and services. It's only in the past few years that um, uh, skin of color has been taken seriously. And the reason why it's being taken seriously is because the demographics in the United States are changing. So by the year 2050, over half the US population will have uh, a skin of color, uh, have some form of pigment to their skin or be considered ethnic. And that is a huge deal. Um, and so brands are having to rethink how they approach um, this demographic. And this demographic is very savvy. 
um, with the knowledge base when it comes to skin and hair. And so they're, you know, they're not just going to take any product or any service. They're going to want to inquire and find out, can this really work for me? So let's talk about the variations in um, the skin types. And as you can see on this slide, um, it's broken down into Caucasian, um, Oriental, Asian, and African. And um, just as a disclaimer, the Oriental term, I believe, is an old term that they used for East Asian. Um, and then when you see Asian here down here, they're more so talking about um, the Middle East, uh, since they're all located in what we call today Asia. But um, some of the uh, variations in the skin types are um, uh, all pretty interesting. So when you look at um, uh, 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 Asian skin, you'll see that um, Asian skin tends to have more melanin. Um, so more melanin has more photo protection. Um, when you look at African skin, of course, they have more melanin photo protection and a thicker stratum, stratum corneum and um, an increase in TEWL, which is, uh, we all know, is trans epidermal water loss. Um, and so those are some of the things that you would see in those um, particular groups. Um, when you look at, um, in the microscope, and you look at African skin, um, or skin that's on the more darker spectrum, when you look at the, the dermis, um, you'll see that the dermis is a lot thicker. You'll see that the fibroblasts, um, there are more of those. And then you'll also see that they have more compacted collagen and also preserved elasticity. So I'm not sure if any of you all have heard of black doesn't crack. Well, it's a term that we use in our community to describe the um, youthfulness of, um, of men and women of color because we tend to age very slowly. Um, not to say that we don't age, we do age, um, but the um, time period in which we age is, is, a, uh, is a lot slower in comparison to Caucasian skin. And so, yes, it's a great thing to, you know, be able to age very slowly um, because of these uh, attributes that I've just talked about, but there are um, uh, some other issues that can occur. So issues such as um, keloids, and I'm going to show that to you in, later on in the presentation, where for those who have um, keloids, because they have um, more fibroblasts, they tend to, uh, their cells tend to overreact when there's some sort of inflammatory response. Um, and I'm gonna go over issues that these, each population tends to deal with. So we're gonna start off with Asian skin. So Asian skin tends to deal with um, non-melanin skin cancer and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Typically the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation um, comes in the form of melasma. So when we talk about post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, that's basically the darkening of the skin due to some sort of inflammatory response. And I'm going to show you how, what that looks like. And Eunice, as you go through this, every woman who's been pregnant in America who is Caucasian wants to understand how to get rid of melasma because it happens <laughs> to all of us. So make sure you touch on that before you finish this presentation. Yes, I will. So this is what acne and hyperpigmentation looks like in an Asian. So here you can see that it's very severe on your uh, left um, and then on your right through medications, and um, peels um, and topical agents, uh, this dermatologist has been able to clear up this skin. So this is typically a, a more aggressive cystic type of acne that you would see in Asian skin. Another point to say about Asian skin, you tend to see that they have more um, oily skin um, in comparison to other groups. And that is because um, they don't have enough um, water or um, retention that's being held within the skin. So they tend to overproduce in oil um, to be able to um, bring balance to the skin. 
I learned that the hard way, just a little tidbit, because um, I always thought, okay, dealing with acne, you got to dry up your face as much as possible. And then I was producing even more oil. So doing the complete yeah. opposite of what I wanted. Yeah. And so um, here you'll see typically in Asian populations, um, cupping and spooning that's used for um, uh, medicinal reasons um, to maybe cure certain ailments and diseases. And those are co common practices in Asia or traditional practices. So when you're seeing clients, you may have a few that um, come in with these types of conditions and you definitely want to refer them to a dermatologist um, um, to be able to uh, treat these uh, skin conditions. So Hispanics um, typically deal with melasma, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and dispigmentation. So I talked about melasma a little bit with Asians. You also see it a lot in Hispanic women, um, what we call the veil of pregnancy. Um, and I'm going to, later on in the presentation, I'm going to discuss some methods in addressing melasma. Dispigmentation basically is the loss of pigment. And so you'll see that in folks that have um, vitiligo. So here um, is a picture of a woman on your left. On her on your left, she has melasma, and then through chemical peels and topical treatments, they're able to treat um, the melasma. And and just a note on melasma, um, it is a condition that has to be managed. It most likely will not go away. And I'll, I'll give you some things later on in this presentation on um, some topicals and even chemical peels, ways to address it, to manage it. And so some of the topical treatments <coughs> for melasma include hydroquinone, azelaic acid, kojic acid, vitamin C, retinoids, tranexamic acid, and arbutin. So you can find these in a lot of topical agents that are that dermatologists typically prescribe for patients with melasma. Also included in treatment for melasma is sunscreen. Sunscreen with an SPF of, of 30. Now, I don't recommend using a sunscreen with an SPF of 100 because it actually does nothing for your skin. But um, an SPF of 30 and 50, those actually, um, really work well for clients who have uh, melasma. Now for folks of uh, Indian and Middle uh, Eastern um, heritage, they tend to deal with vitiligo, leprosy, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and keloid formation. But there's some other things that we have to take into consideration in those cultures and that includes the cultural practice of using um, henna for uh, ceremonial events such as weddings. And in some of those populations, um, the use of henna can cause uh, contact dermatitis, inflammation on the skin. And so you can see here on the uh, left, uh, the design of henna on the hands, but then on your right, you actually see um, those designs inflamed on the skin. And so those are things that you have to consider in, in um, Indian populations and also Indian and uh, Middle Eastern populations, but also um, in um, Muslim faiths, they use henna for weddings as well. So you'll see um, in, North, in some African countries, um, those that live in the North, maybe the Fulani or the Hausa, tribes using um, this as well. And the reason why that there is inflammation on the skin is due to the black dye that's in the henna um, uh, uh, product. So here are some characteristics that you would see in African skin or those of African des descent. Um, they suffer less from UV damage because the melanin in our skin acts as a natural SPF and it's about an SPF of eight, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should not wear sunscreen. Uh, all people of color need to wear sunscreen. Um, we have large melanocytes. So in the beginning, I said that um, everyone has melanocytes. 
Um, but for people of color, we tend to have much larger melanocytes. So the darker you are, the larger your melanocytes are, and the more melanin that you're re that is being released into the skin. And so the lighter that you are on that spectrum, your melanocytes become smaller and smaller and release less melanin that gives you the pigment to your skin. Again, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, keloidal skin, vitiligo, ashiness and dryness. And the reason why um, persons of African descent tend to deal with ashiness and dryness is because we don't have high concentrations of uh, ceramides in our skin. So we're constantly having to moisturize in order to um, put moisture back into our skin. Um, other conditions that uh, you tend to find is pseudofoculitis barbi. Typically that's found in men of color that shave and um, uh, basically it's ingrown hairs. And um, one way to address that condition is just using a single blade razor. So if you notice back in the 1920s, 1930s, when you looked at a black man and in those pictures, they had smooth brown and black skin. The reason why is because they used a single blade razor in at the barbershops. And so whenever you use a single blade razor, it doesn't cut in deep to cause um, an inflammatory response and then in turn cause the hair to curl back in to cause inflammation. Um, multiple blade, blade uh, razors are a no-no for black men um, because what happens, the multiple blade razors actually pick up uh, the skin and cause inflammation. So if you see from the 1920s on to now, you'll start to see more pictures of black men with razor bumps on their face. And that's because, a uh, good background story on that, that's because Gillette, their patent had run out on the single blade razor. And so in order to make money, they had to come up with a new innovation, which was the multiple blade razor. Um, oh, hair interesting. Loss, yes. Um, I have one question about that, if you don't mind me asking. Yeah. So I wonder with the, with the hair, uh, the uh, ingrown hair, and then that leading to, of course, some more issues, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, mm -hmm. would people of color be a really great candidate for laser hair removal, especially oh, like yeah, under the definitely. armpits? Laser hair removal and electrolysis. And I have a question. Yes. <laughs> Is that same methodology true thinking about like a bikini line? Or areas where we're using like a triple blade oh, yes. razor. Okay. So bikini line, you want to use a single blade razor. Ladies, take note. That's some. Mm -hmm. That's a valuable little gem right there. Thank and you. And you can buy those from Walmart, a pack for five ninety nine. Okay. So this is what keloids look like. Um, in the beginning, I told you that. Um, in skin of color, we have um, more fibroblast cells. Um, and these cells are in, that are in our skin or, or make up our skin, um, when they become overactive, when there's any type of inflammatory response, they could create things like this, which we call keloids. Now this, in this case, it's very severe um, on your left. And on your right, you can see that he's probably had some treatments. And some of the treatments that they typically use is one, liquid nitrogen or corticosteroids, silicone sheets, minox minoxidil lotion, or surgical excision. Now through surgical excision, um, it, uh, it will actually treat the keloids, but they will eventually come back. And that's with the other treatments as well. Um, for those who have keloids on their, uh, behind their ears, um, usually you'll see an extra low behind the ear. Typically, um, you can use a compression earring to sort of compress the, um, the keloid behind the ear. Other treatments are um, nitrogen, um, uh, 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 nitrogen oxide, where you can actually freeze the keloid and, and it'll fall off. Vitiligo is another common um, um, issue amongst people of color, and that's just a depigmentation. You're losing pigment in the skin, 
and um, typically it starts off with one part and then it starts to gradually grow. Um, Michael Jackson had vitiligo. Um, in some cases, um, uh, some doctors have been able to repigment the skin using UV light um, in some areas. And it, but overall, typically, you know, what's prescribed is topical corticosteroids, um, immodulators, um, and then narrowband um, UVB therapy. Um, temporary therapies include um, camouflage. And camouflage is basically just um, a foundation makeup that you um, spot treat in areas. And then in some cases, uh, the camouflage can be sprayed on. There are some um, companies that have created um, camouflage that can last for about seven days. That way, um, the patient can have, uh, will not have to worry about doing spot treatments on a daily basis. Is the skin different? So uh, if somebody comes into your practice and they have vitiligo and they are requesting certain treatments, whether that be a peel, um, a laser treatment, or even just an injectable, does a skin pigment difference mean that you have to treat it differently or are there certain things that you need to bear in mind? Yeah, you do need to bear in mind certain things because again, a lot of the chemical peels tend to actually lighten the skin. And so the um, using glycolic acid or salicylic acid or mandelic acid, um, a lot of those, what they do is lighten the skin area. Um, so essentially you're, you're pushing for the vitiligo to uh, the skin to overreact and then cause probably cause more vitiligo. So you know, so we've got lots of questions coming in about lasers. I'm guessing you might touch on lasers <laughs> later. So if you are, yeah, I'm say we're going to talk all about it in just a second, guys. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's look at. Um, so there's a, a huge prevalence of acne in um, the skin of color market. So African Americans, about 37%, Hispanics, 32%, Asians, 30%, and Native Americans, 23%. And um, for those who deal with acne, some of the popular um, treatments are glycolic acid, salicylic acid, benzoic acid, and then using chemical peels for intensive treatment, and then retinoids as well. I love um, using um, uh, topical products with mandelic acid because the molecule size is much larger than glycolic acid and salicylic acid. So it's not um, as, uh, it doesn't irritate the skin as those others do. Um, and so I always say that it's the best place to start um, because of our skin structure um, and function. Um, our skin can um, be a bit sensitive to certain um, active ingredients. And I also recommend mandelic acid for chemical peels as well. And the trick is always slow and steady, right? Because then you don't yeah. want to aggressively do it. Leads to hyperpigmentation. I remember even if you, um, if you're a practice that does, for example, waxing, I remember getting mm -hmm. a, a, a waxing done and it actually made my skin darker um, mm -hmm. because of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Correct, yes, correct. So um, if you see a client with um, acne on their forehead, typically it's caused by pomade acne. And that's just basically because uh, due to the usage of um, oils um, and hair products. And so what happens is to, in um, uh, communities of African descent, they tend to uh, uh, line their scalps with um, oil or an oil base uh, pomade, and we call that greasing the scalp. And so um, that oil can come onto the forehead and then cause acne. So one of the um, key things is, yes, you're going to treat the, the forehead for acne, but you also want to take note and let your client know that they need to, um, when they're greasing their scalp, they need to start from maybe about an inch, an inch and a half from their scalp and grease down. That way the oils will move forward just to right here on the forehead. Um, the other alternative is um, to have your clients use silicone-based um, hair products. Um, 
albinism is another uh, concern. And the, uh, those with albinism, they're born with no pigment at all. So the treatment um, that you would provide for those um, types of clients is sunscreen. And they would need to use a high, co high concentrations of sunscreen to protect their skin because they have light sensitivities. Do you have so, a preference with sunscreen, whether it's chemical or physical or combination of both? So I prefer um, physical uh, sunscreens because um, for skin of color, we tend to um, um, get irritated by the chemical sunscreens. So I love zinc. Um, I love um, uh, the uh, titanium dioxides. And so that now more and more formulations are being created that actually address the chalky look that we tend to get. Um, there's a sunscreen called Black Girl Sunscreen that's, um, I, I've been hearing that's really, really great. I like La Roche-Porsay as well. Um, they have really good sunscreen products. Um, so uh, hyperpigmentation is one of the, um, besides acne, is one of the uh, top uh, two conditions that um, people of color uh, complain about when they go and see a dermatologist. And so you can see here that these numbers are pretty high. And um, we're going to take a look at what hyperpigmentation looks like. So hyperpigmentation basically you are, is the darkening of uh of the skin it can come in small dark spots it can come like melasma large splotches or macule macules on the skin and how that happens we're, um, this is the reaction the first reaction that you um see um is um tyrosine which is a protein that's in our bodies and in our skin um, whenever there's some sort of inflammatory response, um, the melanocytes um, uh, produce the melanin by uh, you, this protein called tyrosine, which turns into L-dopa and then dopaquine, and then it releases U-melanin, which is a brown, that brown black pigment that you see in our skin. Phi melanin is the yellow red pigment that you typically see in Caucasians who have red hair. Um, and so what happens whenever you're using chemical peels or you're using a topical agent that is trying to inhibit um, melanin formation, the second reaction is what typically occurs. So tyrosine moves over to turn into L-dopa and then the active ingredients, whether it's licorice extract or whether it's mandelic acid or glycolic acid, it stops um, tyrosinase um, enzyme and copper from um, turning that L-dopa into eumelanin. So when you're seeing clients with hyperpigmentation, some of them may resort to um, very extreme measures to lighten their skin, whether it's to get rid of the hyperpigmentation or whether it's just to um, lighten the skin for you know, more opportunities. And you'll see that um, not only in persons of African descent, Middle Easterners, Asians, you'll see this um, um, trend in those that typically use uh, um, skin lightening or bleaching agents um, to lighten their skin. And so this is a, a, a picture um, of a South African artist, musician, and she lightened her skin. And most likely she did uh, glutathione injections to get to that point where she is on the right. And um, she said she did it so that she'll be able to get more opportunities um, as a artist. Um, you'll see this in also in Indian communities where there's a caste system where they may want to lighten their skin so they can marry up or get certain job opportunities. And these are things to be aware of because for so long, people of color have been told that they're inferior and um, that um, being told to them in the media for some people of color, they resort to these measures. And so when you see patients like that, that's where you have to put a stop and encourage them 
to let them know that they are beautiful and they don't have to resort to these measures um, to be um, to meet the media standards or the world standards. So you just have a question. Yeah. The, so if the patient comes in like what you just showed mm -hmm. and you're treating them with either laser or pills or whatever, which skin color are you treating? Their natural skin color or what they've now adapted? What's their like biological makeup? Honestly, you'll at this point when they've gone that far, you have to treat them. A, 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 you'll have to treat them according to their previous color. And I say that because they still have large melanocytes That's and they so still scary. can overreact. Um, I would not even venture to do lasers or any chemical pills because um, many doctors have said that when they try to work with um, the skin, when it's gotten to that point, the skin literally cr collapses. Are there some tall tale pictures of what that looks like? Wow. Can you also go through some tall tell signs of what to look for if you speculate somebody has um, bleached your skin? Yeah. Um, for example, you. like the knuckles, yeah. the elbows. I'm about to show a picture of that. So does anyone see anything interesting here? So she's this wearing woman, gloves. Most, yeah, most likely she's a, a woman uh, uh, from Africa. Um, so if you look at her hands, the color of her hands compared to her face, you can see that her hands are much darker than her face. So most likely she's applying the, um, uh, the bleaching agents to her face and not necessarily to any other parts of her body. So um, you'll be able to recognize this when you look at the hands, look at knuckles, when you look at knees, feet. If, the, if it's, there's a drastic difference then most likely that person may be using bleaching creams so um, what happens when you use bleaching creams uh, that may contain mercury and some other dangerous ingredients um, and when I say bleaching creams we call hydroquinone um, a bleach essentially um, it can form things which you see on your left on chronosis and achronosis is basically the bluing or the darkening of, um, the, of the skin. And science says that that's not um, reversible. I think differently. I just think that um, many companies or scientists haven't taken the time to actually go deeper and research this type of condition and skin of color. On your right, you see a woman um, who's been using bleaching creams and she actually um, used it up until the point where she got skin cancer and she ended up dying. So let's look at what happens with um, uh, the effects of um, harsh bleaching. So basically you have your hydroquinone that goes into the skin that um, causes your, uh, that's absorbed into the skin and then um, your melanocytes become very active and then um, they start releasing more melanin. So as you're continuously using hydroquinone over the designated period, and typically on average, a dermatologist will recommend um, about 4% or a little bit higher hydroquinone to be used on a patient that has hyperpigmentation, um, no more than eight weeks. So when you're using it for months and months and months and months and years and years and years, these are the things that can occur. Here are a few bleaching um, facts. You'll see that about 50 to 60% of women in Ghana, which is West Africa, bleach their skin. 40% um, of women in China, Philippines, Malaysia, Korea, um, actively bleach their skin. And Nigeria is designated as one of the number one countries to find bleaching products. And these bleaching products, they can be found in the market um, in those countries. And even here in the US, if you go to certain major cities, you can find them at um, certain cultural markets um, selling at very high concentrations. So you wanna ask before you do any sort of treatments on any person with skin of color, have they used hydroquinone? Have they, and how long? So that you can develop a, a good treatment plan. Now, um, 
some of the things that um, when you're treating a hyperpigmentation, you want to um, consider using um, anything with alpha hydroxy acids. Um, some of the common ones are glycolic acid, malic acid, lactic acid, and citric acid. Those acids are um, really great to use on skin of color. And then you also um, want to consider using retinoids um, for uh, hyperpigmentation as well as acne. So let's talk about some myths concerning chemical peels because chemical peels, there's been a long-standing myth that um, you can't use them on uh, people with skin of color, which is untrue. And I think the reason behind that is because um, there wasn't much done to skin of color in reference to chemical peels. There wasn't much research done. And the methodologies or the protocols were always geared or skewed towards um, Caucasian skin. So now you have more and more dermatologists that are seeing that they can utilize chemical peels in treatments, but you utilizing them at much lower concentrations for an extended period of time. So yes, chemical peels are effective um, if um, they're performed by estheticians, dermatologists, or physicians, um, or um, uh, nurse uh, um, estheticians. If they're done um, well for, um, by persons uh, who understand skin of uh, color, uh, it's a great uh, uh, treatment for, the, uh, for that population. So you just quick, quick question for you. Uh, yeah. You may be going into it here, but we probably have on our line right now a lot of nurses, PAs, um, mm -hmm. NPs who are doing this in their medical spas. Where could they go to find out the best ways, the best chemical pills, the right protocol for skin of color? Because to your point, it's not often taught when we have mm -hmm. the rep coming in teaching us about chemical pills. They're looking at people like me and teaching my protocol. Where would they go to learn more about this? So um, the, my lady has a book um, on uh, diverse skin. And um, the author that wrote the book, she actually, Alish Pierce, she teaches on chemical pills. She's really good at that. Um, and her book is really good where she breaks, um, breaks it down. So that's a really good book to, to utilize. Um, I definitely would, anything written by Dr. Susan Taylor, she is the mother of skin of color. So she's one that broke ground on skin of color years ago and now it's becoming a huge trend and she's a dermatologist um so here are a few chemical uh peel tips you of course you want to use gentle cleansers you want to have emollients and emollients are just your oils um that you'll use um you want to also consider spf 30 um, you want to make sure you have a pre um, and a post uh, management plan, and you'll get into that as you are um, interviewing your client before you provide the treatment and getting a great um, um, client profile to understand what their needs are. Oral antibiotics can be prescribed topical um, uh, benzoyl peroxide with clitomycin gel or dapsone gel. Uh, utilization of 4% uh, hydroquinone uh, and an azelaic acid. Typically, inter intervals are about three to six weeks. Now, you may find that some of the topical agents, um, you may find a few of the ingredients all in one topical agent or like a combination, what we call combination therapy. When would you prescribe just HQ uh, versus HQ with like tretinoin or retinoid. Typically, they will uh, start with it with HQ first because it's proven results. You wouldn't uh, uh, tr uh, tretinoin probably wouldn't uh, be the first thing to start off with. So side effects of chemical peels include burning, itching, redness, swelling, and even more hyperpigmentation. So the whole goal of the peel is to um, reduce uh, acne um, as well as even out skin tone. And so you want to be very careful when you're um, doing chemical peels. You want to start off with 
um, low concentrations and then gradually build up. Um, when you're treating melasma, when it comes to usage of chemical pills, um, we know that superficial pills only remove the stratum corneum, but the deeper pills tend to remove the, um, the epidermis and the a dermal pigmentation. So um, you want to make sure um, that you pick a really good um, formula that can address um, the melasma, typically um, something like with lactic acid. You'll probably see a mix, lactic acid, glycolic acid, or you'll see maybe mandelic acid and another mix of another acid, uh, more of a combination. What kind of brands would you, um, would you recommend? There is a brand called SBK. Um, and she has um, a, a, a slew of different types of, um, uh, of chemical peels. So for melasma, um, again, chemical peels that you want to look into is using glycolic acid, salicylic acid, TCA, and Jesner's solution. And then of course you wanna make sure that you incorporate sun safety into all um, of your protocols when you're dealing with uh, people of color because we do get skin cancer. Um, and that's something that um, I work to champion in the state of Florida. I partnered with them to create this whole campaign to address skin cancer in ethnic populations and also train other doctors and health professionals on how to detect skin cancer in those populations. So um, when you're doing chemical pills or um, uh, treatments for acne or any other treatment, you wanna make sure that in everything that you do with persons with skin of color, you incorporate uh, or stress the usage of sunscreen. So when you're thinking about uh, working with clients of color, there's several different skin health determinants and these skin health determinants determine what type of uh, treatment that you will provide for um, the client. And then also, you, it will also determine the type of marketing that you do to bring those types of clients in. So you wanna look at uh, the cultural beauty standards. Like I said before, uh, years ago, um, uh, and, and, and for a long time, it's been told to people of color that they were inferior because of their skin color. But getting into the 70s, you started to see more people embrace their skin color and then in uh, their hair. That kind of waned a little bit. And now you see a resurgence of that, where there's an unapologetic um, uh, belief in knowing that um, where there's a lot of love for just having melanin in their skin. So you wanna understand the cultural beauty standards in um, each of these demographics because that determines how you uh, treat that um, client's um, skin. And then also, that also determines um, how you market to that client. Um, Looking at other things such as the skin disorders, understanding the common skin and con uh, cosmetic concerns that those populations have. So uh, looking at Instagram, reading books on skin of color, you can, you'll be able to find these types of um, um, concerns and you start to see a common thread. And like I said, the two top concerns that persons with skin of color complain about to dermatologists it, are um, hyperpigmentation and acne. Then you wanna understand the structural and function differences. So for instance, if you know that pers uh, persons of African descent tend to be ashy or experience a lot of dryness, you know that it's because they may not have a lot of ceramides in their skin. So whenever you're doing any sort of treatment for acne or for uh, hyperpigmentation or melasma, you're going to want to make sure you incorporate a topical agent that has ceramides so that they won't experience extreme dryness from those active ingredients. Cultural skin and hair practices, every culture has something that they typically do. Like for some cultures, they, back in the day, they used to use ketchup to treat their acne. And other cultures, they may use uh, 
uh, uh, coconut oil um, to treat acne or hyperpigmentation, or they may use shea butter. Understanding what are the cultural practices that they incorporate on a daily basis um, is important because if they're using um, certain uh, products or certain ingredients or raw materials on their skin, then that can um, it, um, affect um, some of the treatments that you would provide for them. This is a great part. I've held this question we've had asked for like 20 yeah. minutes, so this is a good time for it. So I'm going to read this verbatim. With okay. the trend to more natural products, what's your take on using face oils and the use of black soap? This person sees a lot of naturalists in her clinic and she wants yeah. your take. Okay, so black soap, um, it tends to be a bit drying to the skin. It's Black soap is a soap that um, is primarily made in Ghana and Nigeria. Um, and um, for here in the United States, in this climate, um, I think black, black soap can be very drying. I think it's best to be used on persons with a very oily skin. Um, I think black soap is good, but only those with oily skin, I think, should be using it. And what was the other thing that you, uh, the natural products? The so face, my, about face oils, people who use oils. like this. I think face oils are fine, but they tend to be, um, if you have acne prone skin, they tend to be very um, clogging, some of them to the um, skin. So like coconut oil, there's this belief that coconut oil can is, is the miracle all for all skin issues. And that is the worst thing that you could put on your on a person with skin of color. So I, uh, I, uh, I'm all for natural products. I mean, I incorporate natural ingredients into our products, but um, you have to be aware of what works and what doesn't work. Like shea butter, it's great for moisturizing the skin, um, especially on the body if you have dry skin, but it may not necessarily be the best for somebody who has acne prone skin to put it on the face. So it, it all depends on the on the client and the and the type, but I'm I'm okay with natural stuff, but it just what is the use and behind it? I have heard something. I don't yeah. know, Eunice, if you've ever heard of this, but oils are uh, moisturizing. They're not hydrating. So you can use an oil to have an added layer of protection or sealing um, the moisture you already have, but you need to have moisture to begin with, whether that's like a water-based moisturizer or something like that. Have you heard that before? Yes. Yeah, so oils are emollients. So emollients, um, they're not necessarily um, hydrating. They, because whenever you think about something that hydrates, it's drawing water to, to itself or to the skin. So glycerin is a hydrator because it draws um, water. Um, sodium hyaluronate or hyaluronic acid draws water to the skin. So it's considered hydrating. But an emollient, is, um, like an oil, is not, is more so for moisturizing. So for the nurses and estheticians and physicians, there are several different ways of being able to reach um, the skin of color market. Some of the things that I've done to be able to reach my market is one, using social media, um, using Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and then um, using those platforms to provide education to that consumer about um, the skin that they're in. Um, we've created ebooks as well that um, they can go and download from our website to learn more about skin of color and how to create a basic skincare routine. We've also done lives on Facebook where I actually go in depth about the science behind their skin and allow them to ask me questions um, that they have pressing. And then actually going out into the community, I go out into the community, provide education, not just to sell products, but really to um, uh, give information on how they can um, better take care of their skin. And then when it comes to estheticians, I provide education online and offline. So that's why I hosted um, for the past two years, the Skin of Color Conference, because I saw a huge need for estheticians to be able to understand the science behind skin of color and how to treat it, but as well as understand the business end of it. Um, and so 
these are things that you could consider to uh, help to build a strong foundation. And so in the process of your, as you're thinking about using social media or using local advertising, whether it's through commercials, rate, um, on TV and radio, or whether it's through print, you have to be cognizant of the message that you're um, providing. It, just saying that you have a product to treat hyperpigmentation or acne and, and um, skin of color is not enough. You actually have to show that you really care about the client and understand what their needs are. So looking at this ad that came out a, a few years ago by Nivea, Nivea um, had a, a face body sh uh, a shave for, um, that they were trying to target to black men because they knew black men had an issue with um, uh, uh, ingrown hairs. And so in this ad, they said, re-civilize yourself. And so it's an image of a black man holding his uh, a head of a, uh, which is supposed to be his, where he looks uncivilized to um, uh, uh, other cultures or uh, uh, to media. And basically what they're trying to say is, look like you give a damn by using Nivea. That ad sparked so much anger in the um, black community because like I said, there is a historical context behind how we view beauty for ourselves and how we've been treated in reference to our beauty. And to see an ad like that was almost like a slap in the face. So you have to really think about what is it, uh, what message that you want to convey and how will this message impact that community? That ad's just tacky in general, period. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know we're getting close to our time and I just want to make one yeah. mention of something you've said in the beginning that I think you said 50% of all skin that we'll see is going to be in some way skin of color mm -hmm. in the next few years. I think those of you who are on the on the webinar right now, what I'm hearing you say is this is a business imperative. This is a non-negotiable. So if you're not currently, yeah. if you don't yeah. currently know how to treat skin of color, you're mm -hmm. not thinking about your business, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's marketing or education, whatever, mm -hmm. like when you hang up on this webinar, go figure it out. Because what I'm hearing you say is half of our clientele fits into this Fitzpatrick skin scale, you better know how to do it. I think it's just an important piece right now in our, you know, especially coming back from COVID. Yeah. We need all the help we can get to yeah, expand our market and our, our revenue. Also, you have to cons uh, uh, consider um, diversifying your staff. So that may mean you bring on more um, estheticians or nurses who um, understand how to take care of skin of color. And, um, that it's going to be very key because I, I, I'll tell you that a lot of women of color will not go to an esthetician or a nurse or a dermatologist that does not look like them. And there have been a huge number of complaints. I get emails, calls, um, stating uh, their, their bad experiences that they've had with estheticians and dermatologists. Even as a woman of color, I've had some tell me that they've been turned away because those offices say, well, we can't treat your type of skin. And just think about how that makes a woman feel. So these, this is very imperative. Um, here, uh, quickly, this is an ad that was done in India with an Indian woman, um, and it's called White Perfect. And so L'Oreal was marketing this product to uh, encourage bleaching and um, lightening or whitening the skin. These types of ads are very, very offensive to uh, uh, people of color. So when you're thinking about advertising towards um, people of color, you wanna look at um, who they are. You wanna look at the customer avatar um, and how you're gonna target them. So here for a Middle Eastern woman, she's you know 33, she's Muslim, she's a designer, she wants to still look good and get treatments. Um, and she's married to a businessman, has two young kids. So of course she's a busy woman, so she wants to be in and out. These are the things that you have to think about. So when you're looking at this type of woman, you have to ask yourself, what is it that she would like to have? Well, one thing that you wanna consider is, with her being Muslim, she most likely wants to use halal approved products. Basically products that have been approved by the Muslim faith that comply with 
uh, their beliefs. And so she's going to be more prone to going to a um, spa, salon, or med spa that caters to her belief system. And then also you have to consider that she may not want to see a male physician or a male nurse or a male esthetician to get her treatments. She may feel more comfortable um, with another woman because she wants to protect um, the exposure of her body to another man because of her beliefs. Um, here, when you're looking at a profile of a young African-American wom um, woman who is a graduate student, she's single. Being a graduate student, she may not have a lot of money, but um, she may want to come in and get a few things taken care of. Being the age of 24, she's probably dealing with acne and hyperpigmentation. And so you may not necessarily uh, uh, want to charge her up front for the full series of treatments. You may put her on a payment plan because she's probably not working or she's probably receiving very little income. So these are the things to think about when you're um, uh, marketing. I've got, um, I've got two questions. I want to make sure we get to them before they fall off. Yeah. Um, one is, not to divert from this, going back to melasma, they want some clarification on the 4% hydroquinone going with intervals of cessations, or is it eight weeks max and stopping? Eight weeks max, you stop, and then you give it a couple of weeks, and then you could uh, start again. And then any parting laser information that we should know, too, about using lasers. Got gag, lots of laser la questions. gag la lasers are the best lasers to use on skin of color. Okay. Did you guys get that? Yag yeah, lasers. Write that down. <laughs> um, here you're looking at a profile of uh, a, a Middle Eastern man who's much older, who is a, a billionaire, uh, married with adult kids. He wants to get the best uh, service, concierge service. So you want to make sure if you're targeting these types of customers that your customer service has to be on point because they're not spending money to be treated like trash they want that concierge service and maybe even um not for them to walk into your med spa but maybe you go to them to get give them the treatments here you have an african-american woman who's 60 and she's a billionaire she's married with two kids again She's going to want to come in and get the best of the best when it comes to treatments for her skin. And of course, she looks very young for her age. She wants to maintain that youthfulness. So she'll get the Botox or the fillers um, and the chemical peels and things of that nature. But she wants to know what she's getting, why, why she's getting it. And she wants to be assured that you know her skin because she's a woman that's you know she's facing the world on a daily basis um and she wants to be look and feel her best okay we have so, as you conclude hold on one more question don't conclude yet so yeah. first <laughs> morning to going back to the laser i'm telling you lasers are all the rage she's yeah. wanting to know on the yag um she says is it an m22 luminous laser yag i know there's many yags out there do you have a preferred can she, yag? can she email me so that i can give her the correct um range yes yeah Angela, if you will shoot us, if you'll shoot me an email, we'll connect you. It's yeah. just um, Tiffany at aestheticrecord.com. And there's my T-I-P-H-A-N-Y. We'll get you connected. Okay, awesome. And then also can darker skin types do enlightened pill by, well, we don't know. Um, if there's an 8% hydroquinone percentage, can they do a pill with that high of an HQ percent? Oh, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and so she has start, a, she has start, start, off with, start off with the 4%. Stephanie, if you go to our Instagram for AR, we have tagged Eunice in all of our Eunice posts. So you can just click on the picture and you'll see her Instagram handle. Make it easy for you. Okay, okay. carry on, sorry. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna conclude and then open the floor up to any questions. Here is my, uh, it's been a pleasure to be able to present to you all on um, Skin of Color. And so um, any questions that you have, here's my contact information and I'm opening the floor for any questions at this time. All right, you guys, any last minute burning questions? Would you like Eunice to dive deeper about um, any topics that we kind of um, had a 
go through pretty quickly. So here's your last chance for any questions. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to give her a phone call or email her at info at newecki.com. And then what is the website for Nuweki? Can you give us that, the URL? Um, Nuweki is www.nuekie.com. Um, Go check it out. It has lots of good stuff on it too. So check it out. And then we will, we're thinking about having you at Aesthetic Next if it works with your schedule. Maybe I think we've talked about that and your schedule yeah. was conflicting with the previous date. Maybe the new date we can get you yes. there. Yeah, definitely. So hopefully we'll see you in September. I and then you guys have her contact, our contact. Um, hit us on Instagram, DMs, emails. We'll make sure that Eunice gets your questions if you can't get to her and we'll get them answered for you. Oh, we've got one question, by the way, um, really quickly from Angela. Okay. Why do some offices offer IPL on melasma? Makes my head spin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why do some offer IPL on melasma? Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think for some of them, they may feel like they've gotten results from it or they've seen others offer it and they want to offer it. But, but would you recommend people, it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I would, yeah. And I, I can give um, whoever that, I can give you some specifications. Awesome. Thank you all so much for joining us. Yes. Thank you, Eunice, Thank for being you. a part yeah. of this. This is wonderful. Yes, thank you so much. Mentioned. All right, Bye, guys. you guys, you can find the recording on our YouTube channel. Um, and obviously, every time that we send a, a newsletter out, you'll also have the recording in there, too. So check it out. Um, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, contact Eunice if you have any specific questions as well. Thanks, Eunice. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.